Hello, listeners. The talk today is going to be a talk about personal finance.、Uh, it's quite an interesting and unique、uh, concept that I will discuss.、Um, I hadn't actually encountered this ever before until I encountered it at the blog that I will mention momentarily, and I haven't encountered it since. I don't know. Whether it is popular out there now,、um, I don't really follow personal finance blogs very much these days. So maybe it is,、um, and I don't know where it originated. Whether the the person who、um, runs this blog,、um, which is called Seven Million in Seven Years, whether he thought of this concept or whether he got it from somewhere else or whether he modified a different concept, it's quite unique, as I said.、Uh, but basically, the the concept is very simple, and I'll. Show you a graph that will that will help to illustrate it. Basically, it's it's called the seventy five twenty five rule, and what that means is that there are three numbers there: seventy five, twenty, and five, and they're sort of an ideal、uh, distribution of your net worth. Of course, any of these sort of personal finance rules and so on, they're not like laws of physics. They're not. Set in stone, of course, but they're, they're sort of、uh, rules of thumb, if you like. So there were there were three three、uh, columns, as you can see on that graph. The green column is assets, the red column is residence, and the yellow column is cars and other possessions. And basically, seventy five percent of your net worth should be in assets. That's that basically means things that make you money. Uh, no more than 20% should be in your residence, the place in which you live. It, that's not talking about a house that you rent out. That would fall into the green column of assets.、Um, it's just talking about the place where you live. <coughs> Pardon me. And the yellow column there is your cars and other possessions. So you should only have 5% or no more than 5% in that column. And I'll, I'll get a little bit、uh, in, into a little bit more depth shortly,、uh, but there are a few things I want to say before I do so.、Uh, the first is, for a lot of people, it's actually worse than that, with the, particularly with the yellow、um, column, because a lot of their possessions they acquire through、uh, through credit, basically, and they end up paying a lot more for them than they should. But that's masked if they look at their actual net worth,、uh, because it doesn't. Appear like that straight away. They don't show the money they've thrown away by by、um, paying for those with debt.、Uh, the other thing I want to mention is that when you're younger,、um, the tilt will tend to be towards your possessions and your car, and to some extent your residence,、uh, because you, you you may have less disposable income. But there are a couple of Um, ways in which that can be a bit of a trap if you think like that. If you think that, oh well, I'll catch up in the future, that may be a bit of a trap simply because as you get older, you get more responsibilities, and generally your cost of living increases. And so, if you think, oh well, you know, I'll catch up when I earn more money in the future, you may never actually do that.、Uh, it's good to get into good habits when you're younger in terms of money.、Um, and of course, one of the things about、um, Compounding, how compounding works, is if you do something much earlier,、uh, you, you take of,、um, advantage of the compounding effects of time, and so if you can get an extra doubling period in there or an extra couple of doubling periods, your initial contribution、uh, needs to be much smaller than if you miss those couple of doubling periods. You know, at which point it has to be much higher. So the later you leave things, the more you have to contribute. Um, and you may never actually catch up. That's the thing there. Now, what I want to do is regard、um, the ratio between assets and your car or other possessions. So, based upon that rule of seventy-five、uh, twenty-five,、uh, for every one thousand dollars that you have in in a car or other possessions, you need to have at least fifteen thousand dollars in assets. Because there's a ratio of 15 to one there, you know, 75 divided by five is 15, right? So a ratio of 15 to one there.、Um, now let me just give you a, a kind of an example of this. I, I looked it up online and I found that the average car, the average new car in the U.S. these days, is approximately 31,000 dollars. I'm just going to go with 
$30,000. So if a family has two cars, for instance, they have $60,000 worth of car, or they've paid that. I mean, they're not worth that in a way because um, there's depreciation and so on. But nevertheless, they've paid at least $30,000 per car. And then possessions, I, I don't know actually how much people have in terms of possessions. You know, if you went to the average middle class family's house and had a look at their furniture, you know, and assessed how much their furniture was worth and um, all of their appliances and everything, everything that was in that house, all of the possessions, toys, books, CDs, whatever, you know, um, dishes and, and knives and forks and things in the kitchen, everything, tools in the garage. Um... All of that, I, I, I'm not sure how much that would be. I am just going with uh, 30,000, which I think is not unreasonable, actually, if, if you went there and, and, and um, had a look at all of those things or if you, um, and how much people paid for those initially. Um, 30,000 would probably not be unreasonable. So if we take 60,000 for cars and then another 30,000 for possessions, that comes to 90,000. Now, if we look at that in terms of a 15 to 1 ratio, so if, remember, for every $1,000 worth of those things, cars and possessions, you need to have $15,000 in terms of assets. Uh, basically, that means that for those $90,000 worth of cars and possessions, you would need to have $1.35 million in assets. Now, that sounds quite ridiculous. That sounds preposterous, as if anyone's going to have that. I mean, the... Uh, the average net worth of the pretty much the the median person in or median um, household in the U.S. is only about a third of a million dollars. So it's it's not even close to that. It's it's what it's about a quarter of uh, of where it should be. Um, now you may think, well, that sounds ridiculous, but there are a couple of issues here. The first one is that um, if if you're in a similar situation to that, you probably just have too much stuff. You, you know, you, you probably have too much car, essentially. You know, too much, uh, or you know, a car that's too expensive, or cars that are too expensive. And I know you'll say, well, you know, you need all of these things, rah rah rah. Well, you you do and you don't. I mean, part of that is is to do with urban planning and all this kind of stuff, the way um, society is structured, and and you know, there's a certain amount of keeping up with the Joneses and all of this sort of stuff. But it's killing the middle class as I'll show later in this talk when I look at um, some sort of uh, um, pie charts and so on, uh, looking at the, the wealth distribution within society, it's killing the middle class doing that. Um, I think it's unsustainable, especially since so much of it's driven by debt. And, um, you know, there, there is... I firmly believe that there is a huge coming crisis in the West, and, and it'll... It'll consist of two parts. One will be sort of cultural, demographic, that kind of thing. The other is going to be financial. The two will uh, be related. They will, there will be some sort of interplay between the two. And if you're in the situation where, where you don't have a lot of wealth, you're going to be right at the center of that storm because you won't be able to afford to move away from it. You won't be able to outrun it. Uh, you, you will be stuck where you are and you'll have to uh, grease it head on. And we're already beginning to see uh, the middle class falling apart, and we're also already beginning to see um, the baby boomers who, who are now just retiring, that they don't have enough money in retirement, and many of them are literally going to be eating dog food out of a can and sitting there in winter freezing because they won't have enough money in retirement. They're, they're going to, many of them are going to have very difficult retirements, or they're going to literally have to work till they drop in in you know walmart or something um that kind of thing they're, they're literally going to work until they drop many baby boomers because they have been completely irresponsible with money not just their own money but future generations money which which is a whole other talk in and of itself but basically if you don't want to be like them and if you don't want to be caught in the coming storm you really need to reassess this one of the things we need to do as, as a group on the alt-right is that we need to make sure that we can weather the storm. We need to make sure that, that we don't have any, any um, holes in our armour, any cracks, any chinks in our armour um, that, that would bring us down, basically. We need to have all of our ducks in a row. Uh, I don't know how many, how many uh, sort of uh, cliches I use there, but many, I guess maybe three or four in that one, one little... Mini rant, but nevertheless, uh, I think that 
This is a really important issue. People on the alt-right need to think about this. So, uh, let's actually look at, at some of these things in more detail. All right. Now, oh yeah, so, so I, I want to talk about your house. Um, why, why is the house separate? Why is it a, a different column to assets? People often regard their houses as assets, and this is something I'll talk about in other discussions also. Um, but your house that you live in is not actually an asset in the way that most people think of assets. Assets, in the most simple um, way, can be thought of as things that put money in your pocket. Liabilities can be thought of as things that take money from your pocket. Your house does not put money in your pocket. During the time in which you are living in your house, it, it, it is costing you money. You have to pay taxes to the government. You have to pay to uh, insure the house, maintain the house, you know, do repairs and so on. Uh, you may also have to pay to clean the house or heat the house if you have too much house or cool the house if you have too much house, all of this kind of stuff. Money just goes out of your pocket. It doesn't actually put extra money in your pocket. And people say, well, you know, when you come to sell, you'll make all this money. Possibly. I mean, we, we saw that that wasn't necessarily true uh, in the recent global financial crisis, the, the one that's still ongoing in many places. Uh, a lot of people ended up underwater on their houses. Uh, but even that aside, uh, if you buy a house, say right now, and let's say you, you spent, I don't know, say half a million dollars on a house, and there was another, another similar house, and that was also worth half a million dollars, and then at some point in the future you were to sell your house for a million dollars, most people, unless they're retiring and they're downsizing, they tend to move into similar houses or better houses. So you can say, woohoo, you know, I've made half a million dollars. You know, my house has increased from half a million to a million dollars, and I've made half a million dollars. But you haven't really, because then you buy another house, and that has also increased by half a million dollars. So you haven't actually made any money. You've just sort of uh, run on the spot. Now, as I said, when you eventually downsize, maybe you'll make money from it, maybe you won't. Uh, but in the meantime, it's your house, at the time that you're living in it, is not making you money. So that's why this uh, the guy who came up with this concept uh, thinks of it as a different category to assets. Over time, assets will increase your wealth. They, they keep generating more and more income and you can then reinvest the, that income and, and it snowballs, the whole thing snowballs. That doesn't happen with your house. It actually costs you money in the meantime until you eventually sell it. All right, so what I want to do now is have a look at some other graphs um, and how this relates to um, uh, sort of the acquisition, the accumulation of wealth. All right, so on this graph, what we, it's uh, the composition of household wealth, 2010, and you can see where it comes from there, this information. Uh, there's a lot going on in this graph. Basically, um, the, it's sort of divided in three, and each third has six columns. Now, the first third is the top 1% of, of people in the U.S., uh, and their percentage of gross assets, how they have those gross assets distributed, and then the, the middle third is the next 19%, so the 19% just below the top 1%, and how they have their um, gross assets distributed in terms of percentages. And then the third one is the middle three quintiles. Now, what does that mean, middle three quintiles? Imagine, basically, you strip off the top 20% and you strip off the bottom 20%. Those three middle quintiles are what remain. That's, that's all that means, essentially. So that's pretty much uh, the middle class, you know, maybe the upper middle class, the middle class, maybe even the lower class. But it's not the really rich people, it's not the really poor people. And let's just have a look at what each of those different coloured columns means or, or represents. So the dark green column, the one that's always on the, the farthest left, um, that's principal residence. The next one, the sort of dark, the, the red or sort of dark orange, that's liquid assets. That basically means cash, things like um, certificates of deposit and so on. Um, then the next one is a yellow column, and that's pension accounts. Then after that, you have a light blue column, and that's corporate stocks, financial securities, mutual funds, and personal trusts, basically financial assets. Then next to that, you have a light green column, 
which is unincorporated business equity and other real estate. I'm not exactly sure why they've grouped those together because they're slightly different things. I would have thought that um, other real estate in many ways has perhaps more in common with with the light blue column or, or it should have just been its own column um, because unincorporated business equity actually basically means a business. It's um, if you have a, a stake in a company and you're responsible for that company essentially. Like you're not responsible for, for if you have a share in Coca-Cola, you're not responsible for anything Coca-Cola does. If they go and you know, poison a whole lot of people or something and then they have to pay out a lawsuit, you, you don't have to pay out the lawsuit. Of course, the value of your stock may, may go down, but, but you know, the court's are not go, going to come and seize your house or something like that, right? Whereas, uh, or, or if they incur a lot of debt, they're not going, someone's not going to come and seize your house just because you own one share in Coca-Cola. However, unincorporated business equity uh, means that you are responsible, you are liable for those things. So it's basically business equity if someone has a small business, right? So as I said, I'm not quite sure why they've grouped that to do with other real estate, but nevertheless they have. And then the final column is uh, sort of a, an orangey color. That's miscellaneous assets. I'm not entirely sure what that is. I, I think it probably means things like um, precious metals, jewelry, artwork, that kind of stuff. It's, it's not entirely clear, but I think that's what it means. So let's have a look at, at how things are distributed because they are quite different between the three groups of people. Now, the top 1%, they, as you can see, the, the two highest columns of theirs are basically financial assets, that light blue column, and businesses and real estate in that um, light green column. Those, those two things represent about uh, three quarters of their, their gross assets. Um, and why is that important? Well, those things actually do make a lot of money for people. Um, Businesses, of course, many businesses fail, but uh, starting a business is a way to really make a lot of money because, uh, you know, if, if you buy something else, uh, it's probably already developed, it's probably fairly mature, and so it's not going through a really big growth spurt. If you found a business, it goes through a big growth spurt, usually at the beginning, and you, you get all of the benefits of that. If you then buy into that later on, you don't get the benefits of that, right? Of, of all of that gr growth, it's, it's usually priced in. <clears throat> so owning a business is a really good way to, to make a lot of money. And uh, as is real estate, I mean, it can be dodgy if you do it with leverage, but leverage can allow you to, to make uh, very good returns. And financial assets do overall perform very well. So the really rich people have their money in those things. Where they don't have their money is in their principal residence, because remember the, uh, the 75-25 rule? So they should have no more than 20%. They're well below that. They're, they're just under half of that, because they understand your principal residence is not an asset. You may, you may disagree with me on this. You may believe that's not true and so on. But if you just look at this, you can see the top 1% think along these lines. And it's, I believe there's a very strong connection. And the person who came up with this rule is also aware of that, that there's a very strong connection. The very wealthy people understand that you won't make money from having so much of your net worth in your house, the place where you live. Likewise... Liquid assets, the orange, the yeah, sort of dark orange, red column, that that category also really doesn't make much money. With many governments now running what's called ZERP or um, NERP, ZERP is zero interest rate policy, and NERP is negative interest rate policy. Basically, you don't you don't make any money off having money in a bank or or in bonds or stuff like that. With a lot of governments now, or certainly sort of um fairly stable governments. You just don't make any money off them. In fact, you actually lose money either with negative interest rates. I mean, that sounds really hard to believe, but basically in many countries that are running negative interest rate policy, if you uh, put money in a bank or, or if you loan money to a government through a bond, at the end of the period, not only will they not pay you interest, but you'll get back less than you lent them to begin with. It's bizarre to, to think that people would do that. And of course, the rich recognize that's a really bad deal. That's why they don't have much of their money in there. Um, especially once you adjust for inflation, that makes it even worse. <clears throat> and then pension accounts. Again, they don't have a lot of money in pension accounts. Now, why is that? Because pension accounts, um, often their, their performance is not much better than the market. Um, and, you know, usually it's, it's 
But, well, by definition, it would be in line with the market because some will be more, some, some will get higher returns, some will get lower returns. But on average, they'll be the market because they own the market. Um, but once you deduct their fees, and often these fees are quite ridiculous, there are a few percentage points. So if you're getting only a, a relatively small return and then you subtract the fees and then you adjust for inflation, in a lot of cases, pension accounts don't actually make any money once you do that. Once you subtract fees and then once you adjust for inflation, they just don't make money. And the rich are quite cognizant of that, which is why, again, they don't have very much money in, in that category. And then the miscellaneous assets, as I said, I'm not really sure what that is, but that's actually not very different between any of the classes. Now, let's look at the, the, um, the next 19%. <clears throat> Based upon this 75 25 rule, and, and this, none of this um, shows the... the cars and other possessions. It's really just looking at um, assets and houses. So, you know, it's slightly inaccurate in that it doesn't have people's cars and possessions. But nevertheless, if we just look at this, the, the next 19%, who are more or less the upper middle class, um, they, they just have way too much house. They should really only have 20% in the house. But you can see they have 30.1% which is too much. And you can see, of course, the difference essentially between, between them and uh, the top 1% is two things other than the house. It's really those uh, yellow columns and the light green columns. The, <clears throat> the middle class just have way too much in pensions, pension accounts, which, which just aren't getting them very good returns. Um, they, they also, well, actually, also the light blue column, I guess, they don't, they don't have enough money in financial assets, and the area where they really fall down is in terms of business equity. They don't have businesses. So the things that, where you can make tons of money, basically, uh, financial assets and businesses, the middle class don't have money in those things. They don't have money in real assets, things that are actually going to spin off lots of money for them. Instead, they just have too much house basically, and pension accounts also. Um, that's that's the, the really big difference between the, the very rich and the middle class. The very rich understand the two things that make you a lot of money and they put a lot of their money in those two things. The middle class mistakenly think that you're going to um, make money in these other things and they don't make money from those things. And as you'll see when I eventually show you um, pie charts with, with um, wealth and income and so on, uh, they're misallocating their resources. So don't, if you're in that category, think about this. Don't do it that way. Try to copy the top 1%. You know, if you want to become a top athlete uh, or anything else, if you want to become a, a top musician or something like this, you go and emulate someone who's already very good at something and you, you, you see what they have done to become successful and you copy them. So you should do the same here. You should copy what the rich do if you want to become rich also. And the third one, well, you can see there basically for the, the middle three quintiles, this is essentially the, like the, the middle middle class and the, um, the lower class. I mean, they just have way too much money in their houses, really. It, pretty much all of their wealth. You know, two-thirds of their wealth is tied up in their, their houses, right? And, you know, as I've already discussed, they're not going to make money that way. They just have hardly any money. And then, you know, the next highest one is pension accounts. Again, it's, you know, pension accounts are really not very good. They have twice as much money, essentially, in pension accounts as the rich people do. And look at their, look at their um, financial assets and look at their uh, business equity. I mean... They're just, they're just not allocating their capital very efficiently. All right, so I want to look at the next, the next thing. Okay, so basically what I have done here is I've uh, sort of worked out the ratio. And this is the ratio of other assets to housing equity. So for that previous graph, what I have done is I've basically um, divided everything else by uh, the the um, amounts that they have in their uh, house, essentially. So y you can see the green column here is the ideal. It should be 3.75 to 1, the ratio, because if you divide 75, which is, the, or at least 75 in assets by 20, which should be in your house, you get a ratio of 3.75 to 1. So that's the green column there. The red column is the top 1%. So you can see they're doing much better than that 3.75 ratio, almost three times, in fact, 
better. They really understand that concept of having a lot of assets, putting money into, into businesses or putting money into financial assets because those are the things that are going to compound their wealth quite quickly. So they're doing very well in that regard. Then the yellow column is the next 19%, kind of the upper middle class. They're not doing terribly, but they're not doing well either. They're below that 375 Threshold, And as I showed on the, uh, the previous graph, it's basically because they have too much house and they don't, and, and um, they just don't have enough uh, of their wealth in things that actually make their money. And then that blue column is the middle three quintiles, 0 0.5 to 1. So essentially the, the ratio is around the wrong way. Um, you know, they're in dire straits essentially. Um, they, they just don't have that ratio in it. And, it. and that's really what's holding them back. Okay, so now, you, you might be saying, all right, well, you know, I, I, well, you might be saying, you know, it's to do with the income and, and all this kind of stuff. Before I get on to income, I want to look at wealth distribution. So when we look at this pie chart, um, basically what this is, is um, how much of the wealth in the United States in 2012 was owned by which segment of society. And each of those um, slices of the pie there, they represent different percentiles. So the dark green is the top 1%, then the red is uh, the 99th to 95th percentile. So the people who are just below them, and then yellow is the 95th to 90th percentiles, and so on down, right down to purple, which you, you pretty much can't even see. Uh, which is the bottom 40% of people. Now what you can see there is that the top 1% basically own a little over a third of the wealth, it, or did in um, 2007 actually, um, which is obviously really disproportionate. And then the next 5% the next, uh, of people, they own another quarter or so. Um, and you can see that really the poor people own very little wealth. And that's probably to be expected. Everyone's been going on about the 1% and so on recently. Now, why is that? People would say, oh, you know, they earn more money and so on, right? Okay, but let's actually have a look at the next pie chart. All right, so this is the income distribution. So what you can actually see there is that the, uh, the percentage of the income that the 1% has is only 19.9%. Now, remember, it was actually... 34.5% of wealth. So what that means is they, they have more wealth than they have income. And this kind of shows how, how capital beats labor um, and how they allocate their capital really efficiently. And you can, you know, people might say, well, they don't pay enough tax or, or you know, their, their cost of living for necessities and so on is, is lower, so they have more disposable income and so on. Yes, to an extent, but they still, as I showed you before, they still allocate what they have far more efficiently than other people allocate what they have. Um, you know, in an apples to apples comparison, they're still more efficient in how they allocate their capital. So here, they have less income, but, but actually a greater share of the, um, the wealth. And actually, the next category, the next 5% uh, of people actually do better than them. Um, and... I, I'm actually going to sort of uh, compare these on, on another graph in a second. So just have a, a bit more of a look at that first. Um, but basically, the gist of that, that these two pie charts is that um, the, high, the people up towards the top end are, are more efficient at allocating what they have, uh, the, allocating their income to acquire more wealth. So what I want to do now is look at the ratio of those two pie charts. So what I have, what this is, is it's the ratio of wealth distribution to income distribution, basically taking those two pie charts. So it's the same colors from the, the pie charts. Now the top 1%, if you took their, their um, wealth and divided it by their income, the ratio would be 1.73 to 1. So they actually have um, a disproportionate amount of wealth to their income then you can see that the next column, the 99th to 95th percentiles, is actually doing better. They're on 2.27. Now, there might be a couple of explanations for that. One is probably that the people in the top 1% tend to be a lot older. And at that point, um, they've sold businesses usually, uh, you know, because they've retired and they just want to... Um, not have to think about the business. So they've sold businesses, um, and generally speaking, they've moved more of their 
assets away from very aggressive growth oriented assets to more conservative things that will pro provide them with a with less growth but a more steady income because they want certainty in their retirement whereas those people in the 99th to 95th percentiles they're just behind those people they're probably going to be in the 1% you know, they might be, say, um, in their prime working age between, say, 40 and 60 or, or 65 or something like that. Um, and so they will eventually move into that top 1% and, and their ratio will diminish. But right now they're in a sort of very aggressive phase in accumulating wealth, either in developing their businesses or their careers um, and investing in, in growth-oriented things. So that's probably why, why their ratio is higher. But... After that, you can see it really drops off. And basically, what happens is that once you get to the 80th to 90th percentiles, people earn a dollar, but they only end up with 86 cents of, of actual wealth because they're very inefficient at um, allocating that wealth. And that goes back to um, those uh, that graph with all of the columns that I showed you earlier in that really rich people are very astute in how they allocate their capital and poorer people are not very astute in how they allocate their capital. So it's not, income is part of it, but it's not the whole picture as people always talk about. It's about efficiently allocating capital. And if there's anything I really want you to take away from this is, is that you need to distribute your, your wealth into things that will increase your wealth, not into things that will sort of hold your wealth back, um, that will give you mediocre returns. You need to be very astute about that. And the 75-25 rule is a very um, a, a, a very simple but powerful way of, of thinking about those things. All right, so the very last thing that I'm going to um, do in this is I'm going to do a little bit of a case study uh, comparing my parents and myself in all of this um, and, and you know, how, how we do these things. Uh, now, I, I hope this isn't going to sort of come off as, as being arrogant or anything like that. It's, it's purely for illustrative purposes because, um, you know, my parents, they've been very successful and, and, you know, very, you know, my father worked really hard. He had a business for, I think it was 23 years. And, you know, he was very hardworking and smart, but I think he could have done a bit better better than he did. He was perhaps too conservative with his money in some ways, or, or wasn't really aware of this idea that having too much house would hold you back. As you'll see, my parents, even to this day, have too much house, or houses, should I say. Um, so, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of background. You know, I, I talk to my parents about these issues periodically, um, to do with money and so on. I think, I think wealthy people do with their families, because... Um, you know, you certainly don't learn about these issues in school. Some people stumble upon these things on the web um, or in other sources. It, that was the case with me with many things because my parents were very sort of middle class in their thinking um, and much of this I stumbled upon myself. But nevertheless, I, I talked to my father because I have two businesses and, as I said, he had a business. And, you know, we talk about these things and, and houses and all of this sort of stuff. So um, I'm not going to give you uh, sort of exact... Uh, dollar figures, but basically, I I think my parents, based upon what they've said, and I looked at it once, I think that they're they're pretty close to being in the top one percent. I can't remember whether they're just in or just outside, uh, but in Australia, they're they're pretty much within the top one percent, as far as I can tell. Um, now, looking at this seventy five twenty five rule breakdown with them. Uh, they're doing pretty well on the, the possessions and cars front. I estimate they have approximately 2% or so of their net worth in cars. They're, they have fairly modest cars. That, you know, they, don't, they, don't, they don't need to drive uh, Lamborghinis or things like that. Um, they're, they're pretty modest with that. Um, they're happy with their cars. They get them from A to B and so on. So they're doing well there. And then with their possessions, it's very difficult to calculate possessions. Um, but I estimate approximately 2.5% of their wealth is in other possessions, which, again, is, is fine. You know, those two combined um, come to about 4.5%, so that's under the 5% suggestion. Where they really fall down, though, is with their houses. They actually have two houses, or one's really a sort of an apartment. Um, 
they and they they live in both of these. One is in the city, and the other is a holiday house. And of course, they get utility from that holiday house. I like going to that holiday house. It's a nice place in a nice location, and so on and so forth. It's really great. I love it. Right? They love it too. They spend approximately fifty percent of their time between the two places, so they get utility. Okay, that, I mean that's fine, right? Uh, but nevertheless. Um, they have approximately 55% of their net worth in their houses, which is a very middle-class thing, um, and only 40% in assets, if, if I'm correct in my calculations. Um, and they've always had very middle-class attitudes towards money, and they were over, able to overcome this to some extent because my father had a business that did so well, and so it was sort of just by um, sheer force that they were able to overcome this because... Uh, you know, if I were to actually tell you, which I won't, but if I were to actually tell you their net worth, you know, it's quite a large number. And if we scaled that down to the ordinary um, sort of uh, level that, that most people have and then uh, said that they had 55% in their houses, they would be doing, really struggling in retirement. They're not struggling in retirement. They're quite comfortable. Um, although they still have to watch their money a bit. Um, and, and the, you know, they're still careful with their money. Uh, but they, they could be doing better. I mean, look, you know, that's up to them, of course, obviously. I'm not, I'm not uh, completely criticising them. I'm just using this as a contrast with, with um, perhaps a, a slightly uh, quicker route um, to, to wealth. Um, and that, that sort of middle-class behaviour, well, their behaviour, actually, I, I was going to say that it's, it's very typical in Australia. I would say it was typical in Australia, um, but now it's kind of old-fashioned. These days, I mean, everyone's heavily indebted and so on. And, and when I say indebted, they're, they're not even using the debt to acquire assets. They're using the debt for consumption, you know, holidays to Bali and big televisions and big cars and stuff. Uh, but, um, you know, they do have very middle-class Australian attitudes towards money. Uh, and I think, if, as I said, if they hadn't made a lot of money in their business, they'd be held back by that. And indeed, a lot of their friends are, who, who are baby boomers and who are now retired or at the age of retirement are in big trouble. They're still working um, in their late 60s and beyond. Um, and they're going to be in bigger trouble. Yes, you know, one day some of those people, they just won't be able to work. They'll literally do- drop. They won't be able to work and they're going to be in big trouble. Um, so, you know, the middle class simply can't get by um, having too much money in its houses. And that, I mean, that's a very sort of Australian obsession and to an extent an American obsession as well, you know, having all this money in houses. Um, and it, it is exacerbated in Australia because there's a property bubble there at the moment. It never really burst during the global financial crisis. Uh, but basically, um, the average baby boomer... The, um, and even Gen Xer just has way too much money in his house in Australia. Now, to con- I- I'm going to contrast that with myself. Um, I- I'm not going to tell you the exact percentages, and I'm also not going to put it in dollar terms for you. Um, but basically, I estimate that our my wife and I have one car, and it's a fairly old car. Um, and we don't have a lot of possessions, really. Uh, you know, we're not big on, on stuff. Um, you know, because I, I sort of, I'm very cognizant of the fact that stuff owns you. You don't own stuff. You know, it depreciates in value and you always have to replace it and maintain it and so on. Um, and you have to store it as well. You need a bigger and bigger house just to store your junk. Um, so I'm very aware of that. And and my wife is not, she's not into stuff either. She's actually been pretty... Um, clever at, at um, learning these things as well that I've taught her. Um, so I estimate that our car, singular, and and all of our other positions uh, weigh in at, at below 5%, and I think considerably below 5%. I'm not exactly sure. It's, it's, you know, it's difficult to calculate these things, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it's, it's considerably below 5%. So then we get to the um, our residence. Well, we don't actually own the house. We're not paying a mortgage on the house we live in. We rent a place because rents are kind of a little bit strange in Taiwan. In some places, at least where we are, uh, rents can be quite cheap. It, it doesn't make sense to, to own when you can rent. Um, we don't do that because, I, you know, I recognise that, um, you know, having a, having a house is a liability Essentially, we do actually own a property and, and, it, and we use it for part of our business, but we don't live there. And people would always come along. The place we live in now is, is not very good, but the, uh, 
the, the property that we own, people would always go there and say, wow, you know, look at this place, why don't you live here? And sometimes I would try to explain to them that I can make more money um, not living there and renting somewhere else. You know, even once I subtract my rent, I still come out way in front than if I actually lived there. If, if I lived there, in effect, I would be um, wasting money. And I tried to explain that to them, and, and they say, yeah, but it's so big, why, why, you know, it's so nice, why wouldn't you live in this place? Uh, You know, because for them it's all about status and image, right? You know, they'd rather have status but be poor than um, than eventually be very wealthy and then they could have both wealth and status, you know. Uh, But, you know, they're very short-term in their thinking. Um, But so anyway, we we have a place, but we run a business out of it. It, The property we own makes us money. It's an asset. And that's, you know, we use that in one of our businesses. And um, the other one also uh, makes us money. So we have, I, I... I estimate it's it's you know well over ninety five percent of our money in assets, and you know our the the rate at which our um, net worth is is increasing is again I'm not gonna I'm not gonna sort of give it to you but but it's uh, it's doubling very quickly actually um, the you know the rate and and if I project into the future uh, it's it's going to continue to do that. Uh, because I understand this concept that you've got to have your money in assets. So whenever we get free money, we don't say, right, let's go out and buy you know, an enormous television or something like that. Uh, we try to plow it all back into our businesses because uh, we're going to make more money from that. It will compound, it will snowball. You know, we, we sort of delay gratification. Um, and, and I do that also because I want to get to the point where uh, I don't have to work and I can basically spend time with my family and doing other things that I like. Um, and also because, as I mentioned much earlier, I believe there's a coming crisis for many people and I don't want to be caught in that storm. I'm very cognizant of it and I need to get all of my ducks in a row. So that's another reason why I'm doing this and why I'm telling you about doing this. Um, and indeed, last year, a lot of the money we made in one of those businesses, we poured back into the business in terms of capital works so that we can increase the income of that business and we're already seeing that at the moment. It's you know we just did the capital works in April. It's now uh, July. I think it's the first of July. Yeah, it's the first of July. Um, we've been seeing that for the past probably a month or so. You know, very quickly after we did those capital works, we we saw the income increase, and so we will get that money back. It might even those capital works might even pay for themselves within this year. Certainly no later than next year. Um, you know, which is a huge rate of return. I mean, if you get a one hundred percent return. In, in two years, then, um, or you know, if you double your money in, in two years, you get your money back. Then, then basically, um, you know, you're getting a 36% return per year, which is you're not going to get that in the stock market. You're not going to get that in a pension account, right? So we understand that we pour all of our money back into our assets and acquiring, or either increasing or improving those assets, or, or acquiring more. And it's probably a 50-50 split between uh, financial assets and um, our businesses, you know, I'm always sort of trying to uh, work out where I can most efficiently allocate that money. Um, And in the long term, that will stand us in good stead. And as I said, I'm not making all this to brag to you. Um, I'm I'm making all this because, you know, this this channel is, is, in many ways, it's, you know, it's about the reactor sphere and, and culture and politics and all this sort of stuff. But as I, as I've said a couple of times already, if you can get all of your ducks in a row, when the big storm hits, and I think pretty much all of us can agree that something is on the horizon, it's coming, it's going to get us, we have to be ready for it. If you're ready for it, you'll be okay. And you've got to, sort of, you've got to think about finances as well, not just about you know, stocking up on guns or something like that. Um, you've got to think about finances. Then you'll be in a position to weather this storm. So think of it like that. You know, if you're not someone who's really into money and personal finance and investing and so on, think of it like that. It's just another form of ammunition or, or, or protection or something like that. Okay, so thanks for listening.